Today from the Global Lane, ethnic Christians under siege in Myanmar. Chuck Holton accompanies the Free Burma Rangers, giving us an exclusive look. This church and this village lost over 100 homes burned and destroyed and over 100 landmines found, including in the church property, including in the church. A historic move by Germany in the Ukraine war. Are NATO boots on the ground coming next? This is dinner theater, and they couldn't take action if they wanted to. We've got to start talking about ending this war, which is doing nobody any good. Candidates tell us American democracy and the nation's existence are under threat. God responds with miracles and awakening. We're seeing literally fireball in this season, um, and it's an incredible time to be alive. And for the believers that can hear this, you know, you're alive for such a time as this. New York earthquake, total solar eclipse. Up next, get ready for an insect invasion. And it's all right here on the Global Lane. The military junta in Myanmar, also known as Burma, is intensifying its attacks against Christians and other ethnic minorities. Chuck Holton recently witnessed the brutal crackdown, which included airstrikes and artillery assaults on Christian civilians. He brings us this report as he accompanied the Free Burma Rangers into the combat zone. Deep in the mountains of eastern Burma, gunfire echoes through Christian villages. The Burmese army is driving thousands from their homes as it seeks to crush opposition to the 2021 coup. Rebel armies, though, are slowly liberating village after village. Right now, we are attacking to Luigo, the capital city of the Korean state. Before that, the, the Burma army put in their troops around that Luigo because Luigo is the, the main command center of all their troops. So we are right now attacking to Lyko, their main center. So we are pushing them back. So they have to fall back all the time. For years, the Burmese army has committed atrocities against civilians, deliberately targeting churches and other religious sites. The people living in these villages in the mountains of Burma still live pretty primitive lives. You can tell by the huts that they live in. They're just made of split bamboo. Most of them don't have electricity or running water. And so you might be surprised to find a giant Baptist church built on the top of the hill in this very remote place in the mountains of Burma. But that's because most of these hill tribes are actually Christian. They were converted to Christianity by the very first Baptist missionary, Adoniram Judson, in the end of the 19th century. And that's one of the reasons why there has been this conflict ongoing between them and the Buddhist military junta who controls the country. This church and this village lost over 100 homes burned and destroyed and over 100 landmines found, including in the church property, including in the church. Despite the danger, the NGO called the Free Burma Rangers is using its resources to evacuate civilians and deliver life-saving relief. During the mission, Burmese MiG fighter jets supplied by Russia hunted the group. So we have a recon plane flying over, trying to find this convoy, I'm pretty sure. We've been going this all day. Thank you. Normally when they fly, they'll, after that will come airstrikes, airplanes. And then these planes can also drop mortars. Many of the minority groups have taken up arms, resisting the dictatorship for decades. Now, their aging weaponry is no match for the junta's modern arsenal. So this is an M16A1 rifle, and you can tell how old it is by looking at all the bluing is rubbed off of the upper here. And these things were probably left behind at the end of the Vietnam War. That's how old they are. But you can tell, if you look inside here, that the chamber is clean and well-oiled. Uh, these guys, this is life or death for them, and so they take very good care of their weapons. As the conflict rages, these resilient ethnic groups remain determined to resist military rule, and many believe the goal is finally in reach. Chuck is back from Burma and joins us with more insights. Chuck, you've been with the Karen and Kareni in Burma on many occasions, and I spent a lot of time with them in Burma and Thailand in the 1990s. They have war, then short periods of peace, then war again. So what has changed for them in the past 30, 35 years? Anything? Oh, yes, it's changed quite a bit, actually. And actually, this is a completely different war. 
So in 2021, the Burmese military junta overthrew the democratically elected government of Aung San Suu Kyi. And when they did that, then they got this enormous uh, protest movement among your everyday Burmese people who heretofore had not had anything to do with the conflict that was mostly between the Burma army and the hill tribe people in the north. So when the everyday Burmese citizen got involved and started what's called the PDF, People's Defense Forces, what happened was all of these military uh, militias uh, of all the different hill tribes joined the PDF and they're now united against the Burmese government. The Burmese government cracked down very, very harshly on the people. And that is what started this new phase of the Civil War, which has been going on for more than 70 years. Well, there are always the naysayers who reject the argument that Christians are singled out. They say the military government is an equal opportunity oppressor, fighting anyone who resists their rule. But I testified before Congress back in 97 and said the Burmese troops destroy Christian churches and leave the Buddhist temples alone when they go into these villages. Uh, so what have you learned about these attacks? That's true. I traveled very extensively throughout Shan State, and I saw a lot of Christian churches. In, most of the Christian churches are in Karen and Karen East states. You get into Shan State, you have a lot more Burmese temples. Uh, I saw almost every church that I saw was uh, damaged or destroyed. Very, very few that were not. Uh, but I only saw one Burmese temple that had uh, been hit with an errant mortar round uh, and that had any damage at all. The rest were completely left alone. So there is a religious component to this that's been the much more longstanding than the current civil conflict. It's just that the conflict has expanded to include all the citizens since 2021. And I know it was very dangerous for you there on the front lines as Burmese fighter jets bombed the area daily. You had to take shelter in a drainage ditch, other places. So what difference did it make being with the Free Burma Rangers and other Christians in that situation? Well, the Burmese military has a very big price on our heads. And so everywhere we went, we had to be concerned about spies who would give us up to the Burmese military. Uh, pretty much everywhere we went, especially as we got into Sean State, uh, the Free Burma Rangers were being hounded by uh, reconnaissance aircraft from the Burma Army and then fighter jets. So the reconnaissance aircraft would show up, fly around for a couple of hours. If they spotted us, they would call in fighter jets to strike at us. And so whenever we saw the the surveillance aircraft overhead, we had to hide our vehicles, hide our, ourselves, and sometimes sit there for hours undercover uh, until that thing had to fly away to get gas before we could move again. Okay, Chuck Colton, we're looking forward to your next report on the hospital there. Appreciate your exclusive and enterprising reports from World Hotspots. Stay safe. Thank you, and God bless you. You too. While much media attention this week focused on the solar eclipse, a significant historic development occurred in the Baltics. For the first time since World War II, Germany is stationing its troops outside the country. German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius held German troops in Lithuania as an important step forward for his country and NATO. Is this the start of an escalating war in Ukraine? Well, here with more is John Holzman. He's European policy expert and author of the book, The Last Best Hope, A History of American Realism. John, thank you for being with us. So in addition to the German troop uh, development last month, we heard French President Macron talk about the possibility of sending troops to Ukraine. So is NATO about to take more aggressive action in Ukraine's war against Russia? No, um, this is dinner theater. Um, I live in I live in Europe, and they couldn't take action if they wanted to. The problem is that for the last two generations, the European allies, and let's call them out specifically, the Germans, the Spanish, and the Italians primarily, have spent almost nothing on defense. They've been lotus eaters taking a holiday from history, uh, cross-subsidizing their safety net off America. And now the, the bill is being put forward. And when they talk about these things, they're simply not credible. Well, last week in Brussels, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken insisted Ukraine will become a member of NATO. Now, isn't that one reason why Russia invaded Ukraine to begin with? Putin wanted to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO. Your thoughts on Ukraine-NATO membership 
Is it accelerating, maybe coming sooner rather than later? It would be catastrophic, but the good news is that you need unanimity to do this. And while Secretary Blinken indulges in magical realism, a Trump administration wouldn't put this forward for a couple reasons. One, Ukraine doesn't qualify. NATO membership is a very specific thing. You need to be a purely democratic state. This is a country that suspended elections, unlike the United States during our Civil War, suspended elections throughout the duration of their war. Uh, has stopped other media from outlets from having a, a say in what goes on and have banned political parties. That's not very democratic. And I run a large political risk room. And let me say, Ukraine is far from an ideal capitalistic state, highly corrupt to the point that we've given them $110 billion without auditing where that money goes. And a good portion of it went in a black hole. So Secretary Blinken can say what he, whatever he wants, but there are 32 NATO countries. A good number of them don't want Ukraine in for all these reasons, and neither would a Republican administration. Well, then you have British Foreign Secretary David Cameron pressuring Speaker Mike Johnson to push through additional U.S. funding for Ukraine through the House of Representatives. What do you expect will happen there in an election year when many members of Congress say the U.S. southern border is a greater priority for the country? And as you mentioned, there hasn't been an audit. No, this is the thing that what the Republicans in the House are saying is simply enough. We can't do everything, which should be apparent to everyone, but evidently Secretary Blinken. What you need to do is make choices, and we need to repair our border first and foremost. Every state must control its sovereignty first and foremost. And so if there's a limited amount of things to do, a third order priority like Ukraine shouldn't be what our congressmen and senators are worried about. They should worry about making America shining sitting on a hill or dealing with things like China, which is a pure superpower competitor and not a third order priority like Ukraine. Well, why do you think no one's talking peace then right now and pushing negotiations to end this war? That's a great question, Gary. And the problem is, and I've studied wars all my life and my firm does, until both sides realize the futility of getting what they want through war, they will continue to fight. And both sides still think they can, quote, unquote, win the war, including President Zelensky of Ukraine, who's indulging in some magical thinking, unlike his former uh, chief of defense, uh, General Zeluzhny, who says at the time, look, it's a stalemate, and was pressuring Zelensky to come to the table. We're sadly another bloodletting season away from getting down to the brass tacks. But in the end, they will come to the table because neither side will get what they want through war. But we will have to have more deaths and more wasted time and lives along the way. So this is a crisis the United States should steer well clear of. Well, again, Donald Trump says if he returns to the White House, he could end it quickly. So your thoughts on that, John? Well, I think so. I mean, the deal that, you know, that has been put in place is a deal realists like myself who are uh, close to Jeffersonians and Jacksonians in the Republican Party would put forward. You set up an armistice line like occurred in Korea. You give the Ukrainians or the Europeans do an awful lot of money. The Europeans are up for doing that. A path to EU membership and a hedgehog strategy so Putin can't swallow them whole. And you tell the Russians that if they play nice sanctions over time, will gradually be relieved, but can be snapped back immediately. That's the deal. The problem is getting people to that deal, and we're not there yet. But I applaud President Trump for thinking ahead, because we've got to start talking about ending this war, which is doing nobody any good. So how do we get them to the bargaining table? They have to have more people lose. They have to have more offensives go wrong. There has to be a stalemate for longer until both sides realize they can't get what they want from fighting. As Clausewitz said, uh, war is just politics by other means. Once they realize war won't get them what they want, they'll go back to politics, to negotiating. Okay, John Holzman, foreign policy expert, author of the book, The Last Best Hope, A History of American Realism. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it, John. My pleasure, Gary. America at the tipping point. President Biden and some Democrats say it's the end of democracy if Donald Trump returns to the White House. Trump says if he doesn't win, it's the end of America. Are you growing tired of it all? Well, our next guests say there is hope. God is intervening daily, transforming people's lives. Well, joining us is Greg Locke, pastor of Global Vision Bible Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and Pastor Mike Signorelli, founder of V1 Church, and they've joined up to release Miracles at the Movies, a Fathom film out later this month. Gentlemen, despite uh, political and cultural divisions, we're seeing remarkable spiritual revival uh, in this country. Mike, what are you seeing happening that excites you? 
Well, you know, where sin abounds, grace is greater. And so it's pretty plain to see that Satan is working overtime with his demonic minions to wreck people's lives. Uh, but in the mm. midst of that, God is responding because just like the prophets of Baal versus Elijah, God is never going to be outmatched. And so we're seeing literally fire fall in this season. Um, and it's an incredible time to be alive. And for the believers that can hear this, you know, you're alive for such a time as this. And Greg, it yeah. seems that uh, your focus right now seems more on spiritual solutions to people's problems rather than political and cultural ones. So are you shifting your emphasis a little bit? If so, why? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was kind of known as traveling in the political circles for a long time, and I'm still very, you know, conservative and very demonstrative. But I woke up one day and the Holy Spirit said, look, son, America's never going to be reached politically, but she can be saved and reached prophetically. And I believe what me and Pastor Mike are doing is a prophetic sign to the nation, if not the nations, that no matter how dark it gets, we do not have, in essence, a White House problem. We have a God's house problem. We need to see the church of the living God revived. And we are watching literally both our ministry as well as his ministry, miracles, signs, and wonders on the daily. And so I believe God's got one last round for America. And it's not going to be politics that save us. It's going to be a prophetic voice that stands up and says, enough's enough. Well, let, let me ask you this. On Easter Sunday, someone tried to uh, actually set 200 <laughs> Bibles on fire near your church. And police, uh, have they arrested anyone in your estimation? Was the uh, incident a political or spiritual attack against you and your church? They have all of the security footage, and they're kind of dealing with all the investigation behind the scenes, and so they'll only let us, you know, release so much or say so much. So I don't really know who they have as far as a suspect, but there was 20 cameras on him, and so they, they know what he was driving. But they literally tried to block the driveway to our church, set about 200 Bibles on fire. But you know what it did? It set our people on fire. It let them understand this is not happening at every church. There's not a lukewarm church in America that people are against, right? But people are against you whenever you are actually standing up, saying something, and doing something. My grandfather used to say, the devil hates oncoming traffic. Mike, the last time we talked uh, with you, we discussed your film, The Domino Revival. Now you've teamed up with Pastor Greg and his film, Come Out in Jesus' Name for a new Fathom film event, Miracles at the Movies. So tell us why you've joined Emerge and condensed the two films. Yeah, I mean, it's just an unprecedented opportunity. I, I want to start by saying, if you're listening right now and you didn't know that our movies are in the theaters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming back to theaters, I mean, that's the evidence that, that there are two yeah. opposing systems right now. I mean, when <laughs> Hollywood pumps out, like, filth, whether you want to know about the movie or not, you will, and you'll know when it's coming out. And so sometimes, despite even all the marketing, it just seems like there is almost like a spiritual resistance to uh, movies with messages like ours, which is why, you know, we cannot allow Satan's kingdom to be more united than the kingdom of God on earth. Yes. And, you know, we really need pastors and preachers and, and, and Christians to set aside the denominational boundaries and to say, you know yes. what, it's that bad in America right now that we need to become friends in a foxhole. Like we are fighting a spiritual mm. battle. And quite frankly, the church is losing ground here in America. And so th this is not even about a movie. You know, it's it's titled Miracles at the Movie. Um, but we, it's revival is not a luxury anymore. It's our last resort. Yeah. And so it's like we, we need all hands on deck to get to the theaters to do this thing. So, Greg, what, what do you hope to accomplish with this film in theaters starting April 23rd? You know, we jokingly and maybe not so jokingly say when God gets kicked out of the church, he goes to the movie theater. And so both Pastor Mike and myself in the release of our very successful films, and we praise the Lord for it, we saw people set free, suicide canceled, homes being put back together, you know, people being saved in the movie theater. And that's just what we want to see again. We want people to know that God is not bound by the four walls of a church or a tent. In our case, God is on the move. And Gen Z is hungry for people that will stand up against this woke nonsense and say, this is the truth of the Word of God. And so it's my prayer, his prayer, our prayer, that the merging of these movies will kind of be the, the impetus, if you will, of what God wants to show this generation. That you know what? We are going to lay aside denominational barriers and hierarchies, and we're going to come together for the greater good of the gospel. Because look, Jesus yeah. is not a way. He's the one and only way. And through a movie yeah. screen, we now get the privilege to let people know you can be set free. You do have hope in the midst of what seems like a hopeless civilization. 
Okay, Mike, when and where can people get tickets to see Miracles of the Movies? Yeah, fathomevents.com. It's right there. Just search Miracles at the Movies. Get your tickets. It's worth the drive to the nearest uh, theater. But I want, I want to encourage people, invite the least likely of your friends to accept Christ. Mm. You know, the, the ones that have been resistant, you know, they may not go to church with you on Sunday, but they will come to the movie theater and God will meet yeah. them there. And we have too many stories of marriages mm-hmm. being restored, of children reuniting with their parents in the faith. And it's going to happen again this month. Okay, Pastors Greg Locke and Mike Signorelli, thank you both, and may God bless you and your efforts. We'll be praying for you, this event, and your ministries. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Earlier this month, a rare earthquake was felt in New York City, followed three days later by a total solar eclipse from Mexico to Maine. So what's next? How about a rare insect invasion? Not grasshoppers, ants, or mosquitoes, but larger, noisier insects that pop up out of the ground and fly around. You guessed it, cicadas. Not just thousands of them, or millions, not even billions. How about trillions? Entomologists say get ready for the rare appearance of not one, but two broods of cicadas starting this month. One type appears every 13 years, the other every 17 years. This time they're emerging simultaneously. First brood 19 in the south, then brood 8 emerges in the Midwest. Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Georgia, and the Carolinas are expected to see the worst of it. But don't worry, Georgia Tech professor Saad Bamla says these bugs may be annoying, but they're harmless to humans. All they do is just climb up on trees and pee. They come out and they do the two best things they're known to. They'll sing at the top of their voices and they pee in the wind. And as you're walking, you'll feel this mist because there'll be hundreds of cicadas. But yeah, if you uh, don't disturb them and scare them and get your iPhone out, you can actually catch uh, these jets uh, that they squirt. So don't forget to duck. However, Professor Bamla says the fluid cicadas emit is not disgusting, it's only water. The last time we saw a double cicada invasion like this one here in America was 221 years ago, in 1803, when Thomas Jefferson signed the Louisiana Purchase. So double your pleasure, double your fun. Jesus said famines, plagues, and natural disasters would occur as signs of the end times. Is this one of the signs? I don't know. I think it's just a natural but rare double emergence of cicadas. Regardless, Let's not get distracted by these annoying insects. Let's keep pressing ahead, focusing our hearts and minds on the one who created them and us for his purposes. Well, that's it today from the Global Lane. Be sure to follow us on the CBN News and NRB channels, YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, Rumble, and now on Xfinity Cable. And until next time, be blessed.